Chin is there any difference in playing golf from before and now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a story, but there is, yeah. If I remember golf and how frustrating it was. One thing, golf is better than it was in a really practical way. I score better. <laughs> Everything's better without me. By better, I don't necessarily mean the scores will be better, you know, that others will recognize those better. I mean easier, really, that's all. Not better. But easier is better, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, what, I don't know, I can't know, you probably don't know what you're really looking for. What is it that you seek? What is it that you most desire? It's probably not what you think it is. I'll make a suggestion that I didn't really know what it was. But it turns out that it was peace. It was peace, ease, rest. Being at home, not having to go anywhere. No, no necessity. Not natural needs. By necessity, I mean, it's... Without that, I have to go looking for what will make it okay, make my life okay, make this okay. And I'm not saying that can't still happen, the, the, the thought about that would be good, that would be nice, but that's very different, that would be good, that would be nice, that would be interesting, it's very different from I must do that, I have to do that. It's a matter of life and death. Now golf, like any other aspect of life, for me, can be, can feel like a matter of life and death. If I, if I score worse today than I did yesterday, me can feel devastated. I'm fucking going backwards. I've done all this practice. I've done, I mean, whether it's golf or spiritual practice, it's the same really. For self, it's all the same. Am I moving forwards? Am I getting somewhere? When it's undeniable that you're not getting anywhere, you're not getting anywhere because it's impossible. There's nowhere to get. And even if there was somewhere to get, <laughs> there's no you going there. There's no one to get there. And then, um, whether your scores get lower, which they seem to have done, <laughs> which I like, I'm not denying that, but really the golf itself, there's just uh, the pleasure, the joy of doing, and there's much more joy in doing. You know that mindless doing that everyone loves? M most human beings really love doing a job where there can be, without any effort, there can be an absence. There's just the doing. A bit like I talked about with running. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I used to long, used to go out running, trying to find that just running. No one running. Just painting the wall. No one painting the wall. Just digging the garden. No one digging the garden. And in physical, I don't know whether it's, maybe it's just how this body is, but it is really, it always has been in physical, you know, walking, running, playing sport, where those, what I would have, I wouldn't have called them awakenings, but really that's what you, most spiritual people would call them, is that, that absence, whether it's just what's going on. And seemingly for this body, it, they, they occurred much more frequently in movement than in stillness, in sitting. I found it excruciating to meditate. This body wanted to move, 
just as this body wants to speak. It's the same, really. I'd much rather speak than listen. You may, you may have noticed. I've had, that, I've had that accusation quite a bit in life. You're not a good listener, are you? Well, I don't know. Not that bad. But, you know, the preference. And it's not my preference. Naturally, you know. And really, that's all we're speaking about. You inhibit what naturally a human being likes, prefers. This is liberation for preference. Not your preference. The body's preference. What, what, the joy, what brings the body joy, where the body feels joy. And that's, that is very individual. There can be some common ground, but... So golf is easier. <laughs> and... I mean, there's a lot of cliches in psychology. One of the things in golf psychology there's this beautiful book by Dr. Bob Rotella, who was my golf guru. I had lots of gurus. But I had a golf guru. He's a top psychologist. Tiger Woods used him. Most of the top golfers use this sports psychologist, Dr. Bob. And he wrote a book called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. And, and although it is about golf, and it is directed at self, of course, I mean, there's the analogy, whatever is written in there really does apply in any, in any field, in any, in any pursuit that a human being would pursue. Because it really is, all he's really saying is you need to just get out of your own way, in a nutshell. I mean, it's a very simplistic book. That's what's beautiful about it. Um, so as it seems in golf, I've got out of my own way. And the body is much better at golf than I am. There we go. But I will say that, I mean, the scores are much less important than they were. And there's much more joy in the, the act, in the doing. The hitting a golf ball is a beautiful thing. Striking a golf ball is beautiful if you enjoy, the body enjoys striking a golf ball and seeing it soar into the air. I mean, it is a wonderful thing. If you've ever liked physical pursuits, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you never like them, you will, probably won't. But then it would be the same with playing music, would be the same. It doesn't need you to play the music. How wonderful. And every musician knows that there have been times when it was very obvious that there was no one playing. Just the playing. And of course, the, the playing then doesn't have the criticism, which is the killer of the joy. Quite plain and simple, really. What kills, what kills the, joy, the joy of living? Me. And my analysis of what's happening, what's being done, and how it could be better. So when there's no possibility of improvement, everything's easy, even when it's difficult. So I don't mean difficult things aren't difficult, I mean it's easy than being difficult. <laughs> and in the same way, problems, it doesn't mean that I don't work on my golf game and try and improve it, but that's easy. If I don't need to improve, Improvement for the joy of improvement is very different from my need to improve to feel okay about playing golf. And interestingly, there's much more joy in other people's golf as well. Much more appreciation. I used to hate it if someone hit a good shot because it meant I had to hit a good shot. You know, you, you're actually self is willing, your playing partner, who is supposedly your friend, is willing them <laughs> with all their, you know, <laughs> I'm 
sending such negative thoughts to him. Yeah, if I can hit a really shit shot, then I'll have a chance of winning. It's so horrible. I mean, that's a killer of all the joy. And now there's great joy in whoever hits a beautiful shot. It's, it's the joy of beauty, really. How, and of course, beauty is very individual. What I find beautiful, what this human being finds beautiful, you don't necessarily. But I, you don't need anyone to tell you what's beautiful. That's, that's the most obvious thing about life. And also, there's no... I've stopped... The other thing about golf, which again applies to everything now that seems to be done, is I'm not ever asking anyone else. I'm never asking anyone else how to hit a golf ball. I was always looking at others who I thought were better or more knowledgeable and looking to them for advice and guidance and so that I could become more like them. That's gone. And of course, that's much easier as well. It's not the absence of me, it's the absence of the criticism, you know, that self-doubt. Self-criticism, self-judgment, self-analysis, always analyzing, always finding fault, picking. You know, me's picky, picking everything apart, because if I dissect it, then I've got a chance of putting it back together in a better way. You know that? There's no way of speaking about this without making it sound because if it wasn't better in some way, then it really, I mean, this is fucking stupid talking about it anyway, <laughs> but then it really would be stupid, wouldn't it? So it's no better. Which of course it isn't. I mean, there is, that is the truth. It is no better. Because I'm only talking about how I remember it was, and that isn't. So in a very real way, it's not better. But in the story, No, it's, this is never better or worse. Is that better? <laughs> so in that sense, you know, it couldn't be better. So I'm trying to let myself off for saying it was better. <laughs> <laughs> it would be best, probably, that those kind of questions don't get answered. <laughs> but it just seems impolite not to answer it. <laughs> no, because Tony wouldn't answer that. You know what I mean? No, there are speakers who speak about this who wouldn't answer that question. There is no better or worse. There is no was, so of course there's, no, there's nothing better. But then I just talked for 10 minutes about it. <laughs> How about Which is more fun, you know. Say again. How about the sex life? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Better or worse? Yeah, that's a good question. Easier. <laughs> Easier. No, a sex would be the same. You know, <laughs> well, I don't really know. I, I've talked mainly to men about sex, so I seem, I, I really can only talk from a masculine perspective about heterosexual sex for men because they're the women you know they're a bit reluctant to tell you how it really is for them in sex I found although that would be more interesting and uh, yeah the the lack of criticism and lack of expectation is immeasurably easier so bet in that sense better it's just the same as golf. Sex isn't different from golf, really. <laughs> Putting it in the hole. I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that, but it came as a thought. And there it is. Which hole? Hole in one. There's so many sexual analogies in golf. I won't start on those. I've got a hole. I could reel the loads off. As you can imagine, men together, there's a lot of that. Anyway. But it is the same, because really what spoils sex, or can seem to make sex um, just like golf, stressful, 
is performance, anxiety. Just like sitting here, would, there would be, for me, there would be a lot of performance anxiety, any performance. And of course, I don't know, I, I'm guessing it would be the same for women, you know, am I pleasing, am I pleasing him, am I pleasing him, what does she think of me as a lover, all of that. Now, I'm not saying those thoughts can't appear, but they appear a lot less and they don't mean anything. They don't, they don't create fear and anxiety about, am I good enough, really? That's... So when, the, <laughs> when there's no possibility of me being good enough because there's no me being good enough, there's no not good enough. It's, in that sense, it's always enough. So this is always enough. There is an enoughness about this without me that's hard to talk about and hard to convey. I, I often say okayness. This has an okayness about it that it never had for me, or very rarely, that everything is okay. Why is it okay? Because it is. And it's that simple. And that doesn't ever make sense to me. Because I can always find fault. But even the finding fault or the anxiety, whatever appears, is all okay. So being a poor lover is okay. Being a poor golfer is okay. You know? I'm talking about the end of self-improvement in anything. So you're no longer reading, I'm no longer reading Dr. Bob Rotella in order to be a better golfer. I'm no longer reading The Joy, and Joy of Sex or The Karma Sutra in order to be a better lover. There's no interest in becoming a better lover at all. There's no interest in becoming better at anything. So that, again, is, could, that is why I can really honestly say this is not what you want. It's not what anyone would want. Because one wants to be better. That is what I desire. And that better can be, is very individual. Each human being has its own selection of what is decided would make me feel okay about myself. And it can be obvious that those, the choices that you've made about what you need to improve about you in order to become good enough are very conditioned. They're not actually anything to do with, they were never your choices. They were chosen for you, a lot of that, you know. The paths you went down to pursue, to become good enough, to become worthy, to become acceptable. I guess a lot of the ease is that there's, without you, your desire to be acceptable, to be good enough, in the eyes of others, if that's not there, that's what I'm talking about. And by others, I mean myself as well. You know, the one who's criticizing. So I want others not to criticize me, and I want myself not to criticize me. There's great freedom in not being afraid of being criticized. That doesn't mean you don't prefer. <laughs> there's, still, there's still a preference for being liked and disliked, of course. But being disliked does not have anywhere near the fear that it had, if any. Because it's obvious that someone can't help but dislike you. If someone dislikes you, it's nothing to do with you. <laughs> and they can't help it either. It's nothing to do with them either. You, you're not choosing what you like, isn't that? I mean, there's, that's wonderful. That. That's just a great freedom. I mean, you say you've, you're choosing what you like. That's me does. Me claims that. Rubbish. Absolute bullshit. I mean, you know you like things against your will. Self knows this. 
There's things I like and I have to pretend I don't to myself. So it's really nice to say, you know, somebody asks you about, do you like that? I'm, no, it's fucking rubbish. Now, I don't mean it's rubbish. I just mean you know, that's how it feels. And that's lovely. Even if you're offended. Because you want my agreement, you know. You, you, you don't, I don't mind. I don't mind disagreement. I was always afraid of disagreement, most selves are, because you want to be part of the group and any disagreements are threatening. And they're not. It's a great freedom from needing to belong, because self needs to feel it belongs to a group and it belongs to, you know, all the attachments. Now attachments are lovely, but they're not necessary. They're only necessary for me. They're essential for me. Otherwise, I feel the intense <clears throat> dread of loneliness. Loneliness is a is a is greatly feared by self. This isolation that I feel, and I so I long to connect with others, and then I belong. That's why, you know, <laughs> groups are so powerful for me, so that I don't feel this dreadful isolation of separation, because I've connected. Well, there is no one to connect with. This is utterly alone. I'm guessing that's not what you want to hear. So a lot of what self does, a lot of motivation, is to not feel the essential aloneness of being human. This is utterly alone. Utterly. There is nothing else. There are no others to become one with. That's dreadful for me. And if that hits, it's, that's really a lot of the fear and despair that self can feel in hearing this comes with the, the devastating revelation that, oh no, of course, if there is just this, there is nothing else. So there is no possibility of becoming one with another. Any other, however you fantasized about the other. So the other human, the other self, or the greater, you know, the absolute self that you could become one with. No, oh, there is just this alone. Only one alone, only. All the same word. You know I like words. It's all the same root. It's only. So the onlyness, and it's a great paradox, but is the impossibility of being alone. Because alone is, there are others that I could connect with, and I'm not. I'm separated from them. No, there is no separation. So great paradox is the complete aloneness is the impossibility of loneliness. I don't know if that makes sense or not. <laughs> I've noticed what makes sense here, words come out, they don't necessarily <laughs> land as making sense. But when there, if there is no other, then... Because loneliness is the, right, the possibility of others, and I'm not. So in the impossibility, there's no loneliness. I used to hate being on my own. You might guess I'm very sociable and gregarious and extrovert. I'm much less extrovert than I used to be. I've had quite a few people say, you used to be so much fun at parties, you're fucking boring now. <laughs> and it's true. There's some truth. In the story, that's really true. Because I would do whatever I could to get as much attention as possible. Hence, I still enjoy doing this. <clears throat> but it was always, there was always, there's an edge of desperation about all of that for me. And I know, speaking to introverts, they would like to do that. They're just too fucking scared. 
You know, it's not that the introvert didn't want to be loved by everyone, but there was too much fear to be the center of attention and it felt too uncomfortable to do that. But this longing is universal for selves, I think, this longing to be, to connect with the others so that I don't feel this loneliness, this isolation. So when I talk about this, this alone, there's no sense of loneliness or isolation in it. How could there be? It's everything. <laughs> Because the loneliness is only in the anticipation or the imagination of connection. And yet, the, uh, so, I mean, that is great. It's, it's great to be okay alone, not seek others' company. Like, I used to be desperately seeking others. So there's a great... Life is much easier without that. I have no sense that this is a dream, by the way. You know, the, the typical or the traditional way of speaking about in Advaita is that there's, this is Maya or Leela. I never know which is which, really. I'm not very good at the hint. I'm not very good at the language. But you know it, that this so... What's seen is illusory, and there's a reality other than this is a veil, and then beyond the veil, no veil. There's no veil to be lifted. You can't call me in the veil. But what I mean by, uh, yeah, so you could call me the veil, but the appearance is often talked about as a dream or a play, it's not real. Well, there's nothing else that's real. So if you want to say nothing's real, then that's, I think that's okay, but... <laughs> there isn't anything else that's real. It's, that's... Because really that's, the, if, the, if the search is going to end, if, <laughs> if there's any possibility of the search ending, then this has to be all that's real. Otherwise, you're just going to carry on seeking what's really real, if this isn't really real. If this is only illusory, if this is only a dreamt reality, then of course, that's what me wants, because then I can carry on seeking the absolute reality, not this dreamt reality. This isn't dreamt. What's thought about it is dreamt, what's said about it is dreamt, what's believed about it is dreamt, but not this. <coughs> Self loves the idea of being the dreamer though. You know, I like that, because I could wake up, couldn't I? That's fucking, no wonder that's been popular for thousands of years. <laughs> it makes perfect sense to me why that's been such a popular message. Because if I'm, if I'm the dreamer of this dream, I could wake up to the real, and I want the real, I want to know the truth. It's not some half truth, you know, not some truth that's been told to me. I want to know the truth. So if the truth is unknowable, that's the end of it. That is the end of seeking, right there. But is it possible to stop seeking? For me, is it possible for me to stop seeking? No, me is seeking. That's how it felt so anyway. It's impossible to. For a human being? Mm. Or for me? I don't know. They're, they're equally illusory. The seeking and the me, and the one who is seeking, is the same illusion. Mm. You know, mm. There really is no seeking, and there is no one who is seeking. And they're not two, they're the same, oh, I'm going to say energy again, the same motivation, the same sense of there must be more, something else. If there's something else, I want it, don't I? You know, that's all right, that's <laughs> whatever I'm attracted to. If there's more of that, I want more of that. I 
I mean, all that seems to have happened is that it's impossible that there is more, and so there, the seeking just is dead in that. It just doesn't, it doesn't arise if there's no more. Because there is nothing to seek. <clears throat> That's it, really. And that is the death of me, or what I called me, because I was that needing to know. Somewhere else to get to. I'm guessing, I mean, I'm guessing you all know this already. You've all had that sense of... Um, I never moved, I never went anywhere. And for all my efforts, improvement, they're all, they don't mean anything. I'm guessing you've all felt that at some point, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Most human beings don't seem to feel that. They're always on the, <laughs> it's like they're never off the path, they're never, they're never off the wheel always running. I think you said yesterday there's something like liberation for the, for the asshole in me, for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I think there's some truth in that. Yeah, and that's a good uh, title. You know, that, oh, you like that as a title? <laughs> liberation for the asshole. I just have a big, a big asshole on the front. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it sounds good, but it's the end of feeling like an arsehole, you know. People will tell you you're an arsehole, but you don't feel like an arsehole anymore. You neither feel grandiose nor insignificant. Yeah, neither significant nor insignificant. It's, you can't even say... It, it's no longer possible to say how you feel about yourself. He's realized it's really obvious that you always made that up, just as we talked about first thing this morning. Make that shit up every time someone asks you. So really you don't know. Someone asks you, and then you make some shit up about it. That's the truth. That's what everyone does. And we all collude with each other to say, that's true. Oh, are you telling me the truth? Because really, the other, the, other, the other never knows whether you're making some shit up or, you know, it is really how you feel. Well, there's no difference, really. <laughs> other than maybe hiding sadness or anger or, you know, because you want to seem to be nice. It's a bit like being transparent. Because I'm, I, I know you can't see me. <laughs> Whereas you're probably still convinced that others can. Mm, they can't. No one's ever seen you. So, what we call self consciousness really is that illusion that others could see me because I can see myself. It's not true. No one's ever seen you. I saw a video with Tony where they just said, unmute him. <laughs> just unmute him. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd mind at all if I get challenged. This doesn't feel like it needs any defense. So I don't think I'd get defensive because that's really what an argument is, isn't it? You know, I have to, I have to uphold my point of view, as if this is my point of view. But this isn't my point of view at all. I don't believe any of this shit. Isn't that? I mean, that's incredible, because everyone thinks it's a belief, and it's not a belief at all. I don't believe any of it. I couldn't care less about any of the words. I don't think people believe me when I say that, because it, it doesn't sound believable. To self, that doesn't sound, mm, of course it's a belief, it has to be a belief. It's not. This takes no belief, does it? I'm only talking about this. I don't know what this is. 
What is there to uphold? What is there to defend? And then it can be really funny <laughs> most, what most people's beliefs are, especially in God, that God needs your defense. And I don't think he would. You know, as if God would need you to defend him. And of course, the other thing that is misheard is that I know what I'm talking about. I understand what I'm talking about. I don't. I don't have any idea. And yet the ideas come. But there was a time <laughs> in the story when, of course, I wouldn't have been able to say any words. The words, the words don't, the words spontaneously appear. You don't know where. The illusion is that you know where the words are coming from. They're coming from you. You've thought of the words and then the words appear. The speaking appears or the writing appears. That's not how it is. You don't know. We were talking just before the meeting and I said about how it is when someone asks you how you are. The most common way that we speak to each other and introduce ourselves to each other is we ask each other how we are. And someone asks you, how are you? And then you've got to work out how you are. Because yeah. you don't know how you are. You make some shit up. Don't you? Yeah. Someone asks you how you are. And you may just have a, a phrase that you say to everyone which I could say that's how it is here now, I'd just say fine. Because <laughs> you don't, because then you it usually, because you're not interested in having a conversation about how, how you are, it sort of cuts it dead. Yeah, fine, thanks. How are you? But you have to say how are you because it's, manner, it's the manners. But you don't want to say how are you because the other person is going to then start thinking how they are. And who knows how long that will be. <laughs> it could be, you could be there for half an hour, couldn't you? <laughs> Listening to an elaborate thought story of what, and really, it's not how they are, but a story of what seems to have been happening in their life and regaling you with all their problems, usually. If they've had some success, you're going to get that as well. But usually it's just problems, isn't it? How things aren't going their way. Poor me. But the honest answer, I think, <clears throat> the honest answer is I don't know. How are you today, Tim? Oh, sure. Yeah, just that. I don't know. Hmm. And then let me think. Yeah. You, it's like a check in, what, what, what feeling, and then you have to name, we have to categorize, so you have to think of, so what is this sense of being, how is it at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty good, all right, usually. But what you're not allowed to say in that conversation is, really, really shit. Which could be, oh, I'm dreadfully sad. Which could well be true. Even though you're still performing as okay. But really you don't know. And that's all that this, all that really is being spoken about is, without the sense of, I know I am, I don't know how I am. Without I am, I don't know how I am. I don't know. So you, you've heard all the speakers who speak roughly about this, vaguely in the same way about this. There's always this sense of not knowing. The truth is not knowing. And then knowing is placed on top of the not knowing as a, like a veneer 
this veneer of knowing that we live in in relation with ourselves and with others. Well, without the sense of I know myself, that doesn't appear. And so then you're left with the question of, well, what is in its place? Well, you know, without that, what is in its place? And again, I don't know. The word that always came up here, it comes up less, I have to say, than it, it did, is emptiness. So what is there? There's nothing in its place. So there's a sense of emptiness, which is simply not knowing. When I say the word emptiness or nothing, it really is just another, it's a way of saying, I don't know. The absence of the illusion that I know myself. So then, if I don't know myself, I don't know anything else. Because I only know other things in relation to me. But I know the names of them, most of them. Some things are forgotten. But you know how terrified um, most cells are of Alzheimer's. If you don't know, my dad had Alzheimer's for 10 years and slowly declined, you know, memory loss. Self is, self is terrified of memory loss. Most selves have a real fear of early onset Alzheimer's or dementia, or I'm losing it in any way, actually. But of course, losing it, losing my memory, I really have the sense of I will lose myself. And self is terrified of that. But I'm not talking about losing anything. Nothing is lost. I'm not talking about Alzheimer's. I'm not talking about dementia. I'm just saying that the illusion that you know can be lost. And there's still knowing, but you don't. The knowing is empty. You know, and knowing the names of things and knowing how things seem to work, understanding, we could call that, is empty. It means nothing. And that was a real, that was a real shock here when one thing that was a revelation is all my understanding, and I worked hard to study this. <laughs> all, my, all my psychological understanding, all my understanding of Advaita and getting it. You know that all you can do really, all self can do in studying anything is try to get it. Now, it might have already dawned on you that no matter how well you feel you've got this, you haven't got it. If that hits, that is devastating. That's really, <laughs> that was really shocking. And that can lead to despair, that can feel like despair. So everything, no matter what I try, no matter how hard I have tried, and everything that I've accumulated is all for nothing. But that is what's being spoken about. It is all for nothing. That's liberation. Freedom from. Oh, because he understands more, because he knows more, he's closer, or he's higher, or he's better, or he's got it, and he's got what I want. I haven't got what you want. Wonderfully, no one's got what you want. There's nothing to get. And no one to get it. And again, it's, it sounds like, well, how do I know that? I don't know that. I don't care that I don't know that. It just seems obvious. And they're not looking to anyone else, not coming to any of these meetings not watching YouTube anymore, not buying any more books on Amazon. I mean, that is hugely liberating, but it does leave this vast open space of no seeking, which is very, it can feel overwhelming, overwhelmingly empty. You have this big about fullness. I don't, do I? When you say emptiness, is there a fullness in that emptiness? Would you say that? I could say it, 
but it, it doesn't feel full. No. The word completeness, wholeness, seems a much better way of... Yeah. So, I think the fullness, I think... I don't know. I have no idea. But I think speakers use the word fullness to balance emptiness. I do, honestly, because emptiness sounds too dreadful. And I don't know that. I don't know that at all. And of course, yeah, this is full, but it's full of emptiness. And I, I think to a seeker, Fullness is really, fullness is what the seeker desires, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And maybe, I, and this is not consciously here that I don't use the word fullness, in fact you're the first person who's ever said that, and I think maybe I say it now and again, but I th there's no sense of fullness really. Just on, onlyness is the best word, there's just only. There's not, onlyness isn't a word. <laughs> but maybe I'll use that. This, this is only, and so it's full in the sense of there isn't anything else. But I just think fullness is like, it's the whole sense of my, you know, my cup is only half full that self has. Yeah. There's a need, I want filling up, don't I? I long to be full and overflowing. You know? It's all the myths of joy, really, I think. I really... There is something here that wants to kill all the fantasies of endless bliss and joy. I, I really, I do, I like to tread on those, really. I do, there's something here that I don't like it because what it's saying is, it, again, it's just making most emotions wrong, most feelings, most, most of what we call being human is made wrong in the fantasy of, oh, there could be a place where there's just joy or bliss, or peace. Because when I speak of, I, I could say there is only peace, but that's, the peace is in all the emotions. So, you know, there's peace in sadness, and there's peace in anger, and it, that's not rational. But when I talk about peace, it's because it's empty. It's, and that's the peace. So the peace is, regardless of, in spite of what's, appearing. Everything is. And if I, I could really substitute the word empty for peace. But no, that's interesting that you said that. I, I wasn't even aware that I don't use the word fullness. Now that we're on the subject um, of which words you use and which you don't, a lot of speakers use the word energy. I have no idea. What the hell? Do, energy is a, is a word that sounds like we know what we're talking about. What the fuck's energy? I don't know. No one. Uh, uh, so energy is used, it's, this is only how it feels here, as a, oh, I'll say energy, and then it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. And the other, each of the human beings listening to it will... Oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> Fuck off. No one knows what energy... I mean, really, no one knows what electricity is. There we go, that's energy, isn't that? That's the energy we use. No one knows. Energy. You could say, but I try and not use any scientific language when I'm speaking about this at all, because it gives a complete... For me, it would give the, completely the wrong message. That message being, I know what I'm talking about. Scientists know what they're talking about, don't they? Seemingly. So whenever Tony used the word energy, I go, what? What's he, what does he mean? What does he mean? I don't know what he means. And everybody go, oh, yeah, energetic. Yeah. I go, what? what do you mean? I don't know. You could say that, I mean, I'm, I'm picking on energy there. You could say it of all languages the same. We all pretend we know what, but your interpretation of energy will be very different from mine and different from hers, and he would have another interpretation. 
I guess the main way energy is used is energy, energetic contraction and energetic expansion. I have no idea about that at all. Not energetically, no. I don't get that. I don't even know what it means. So the words that make sense here would be a felt sense. Bodily felt sense. So bodily felt sense of being inside is how I would describe it, how it feels to be me. To be trapped, to be inside. That's the separation. And it is felt. So I am... I actually, as me, I feel I'm inside, so the legs are, my, are me. You know, this is, this is me and that, and it, it's the boundedness, and it is, so whether you, <laughs> I mean, I think, it's only, I think it's only language, but I wouldn't say that's energetic, but it is felt. So if you say feelings are energetic, really, I mean, for me, I think the energetic contraction is just that this conviction that I'm inside. That's it. I don't, you don't have to get technical about it. Most human beings are convinced that they're inside the body. <clears throat> That's where I live. And then I move around inside the body, driving. I like that. You know who's driving the dream bus analogy? That's, that's a good analogy for self, isn't it? Being the driver. That's, that's, that feels... <laughs> that feels true, how it felt to be me. And then, without me, there's no sense of it being in a vehicle. So you could say there's, there's a vehicle just driving itself. You know, you can get these um, automated vehicles without drivers now, can't you? Taxis that don't have a... You could say it's like that, but it's not really like that because there's no sense of being... being the body. One thing that is a great relief is you know how much you worry about your body. You know that, don't you? Yeah, that's gone. I couldn't give a shit about this old carcass. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, how wonderful is that? I would be so, I was very neurotic. Being a sportsman, of course, every injury, I mean, end of my career, end of my goals, I'll never achieve what I'm going to, you know, the, this precious, precious body that's mine. Now, yeah, it's precious, but it's no more precious than anything else. Of course, if you're honest, your body is much more precious than anyone else's. That's shit, isn't it? That's, that's the crap of being me. If every self was honest, everything you've called yourself is much more precious than anyone else. It's quite horrible, you know? <laughs> Most selves don't admit it, but... So to be free from that, so, the, you know, this body is getting old and falling apart. It's got lots of um, wear and tear, you could say. Could do with a full re service, but <laughs> unless you've got bupa, unless you've got private medical insurance, you know, it's not easy to get new parts. <laughs> I would. I'd have a new hip before it gets really bad. But it's funny because I would have really, there would have been a lot of anxiety around it and, um, and fear about what's to come, you know, about um, one day I won't be able to walk or it'll be, it'll be awful. And that'll be dreadful, won't it? Well, there's none of that. And it's not that I think of it and it's, that's okay. It just doesn't, it just doesn't come up and it doesn't, it's not mine. Isn't it wonderful that your body's not yours? Nothing is. It doesn't mean I wouldn't fix any, you know, fix anything. If I've got a headache, I take paracetamol. It's really the fears. That's really the, the, the most relief. <laughs> the motivation to speak about this is really that there's much less fear because I was always afraid for myself. 
afraid for my future, really. Yeah. But the body can have a natural fear of death, you know, in order to survive. I would say it's got a natural avoidance of death, but I don't think the fear is natural, no. I don't think, I don't think um, animals are afraid of death, they don't know death. No. We've, we're, we have to imagine death in order to be afraid of it. And then, if, if you imagine death, maybe you could still have fear about it. But most of the fear is, is uh, you ask a dog if he's afraid of dying. Seriously. If he could tell you, I don't know. But I'm sure he would go, I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, I don't understand. Can you rephrase the question? <laughs> what is this death you speak of? <laughs> it's not, is it? So we're the only ones who are afraid of death. I am. And of course, I am afraid of other human beings' death as well. But only the ones who are attached to me, who are part of me. Because part of me dies. I mean, it's a cliche, isn't it? Somebody beloved dies, part of me died with them. You hear it all the time. It's a, it's a cliche thing when... <sighs> but fear can be natural. Oh, no, I think fear is absolutely natural. So fear of... Um, you say you attacked me physically, then there would be a defence response. That's natural. Mm. But the neurotic fear for my own, my own safety is what I'm feeling. That's really what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's why it, why life feels so much more empty because life life was filled with that. My life was filled with neurotic fear. A lot of what I called planning, a lot of what I called checking, being careful, looking after myself was all fear. All those thoughts were fear, and most of life was filled with those thoughts. No, I don't think fear, uh, fear of death is natural. I think sadness of death is natural. Mm. That's the natural bit. The fear is so I can try and control it. I, I can do something about it. Whereas naturally, there's nothing to be done about any of that. And... Um, there can be a really an overwhelming sadness with that. So there is, there is sadness with this. So I'm offering you the sadness, not the fullness. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I'm not getting many people. <laughs> Fucking hell. Change your spiel. You could really, with this, you know, you could change the language slightly and it suddenly would be really attractive. Yeah. I'm well aware of that. The power of sadness. <laughs> <laughs> but really, <laughs> the thing about sadness is, uh, I mean, it's what self is always trying to avoid. And self won't have it that sadness is love, you know. The, 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 oh, that's really one of the most natural, the most natural parts of being human is that we feel sadness. But we are really heavily conditioned to not feel it. You ask most parents what they want for their children, they go, I only want them to be happy. You heard that a lot when you were a child and your parents don't, never liked you being sad. If you cried, you would always be told, nearly all of us were told to not stop crying. Because the parent didn't want to feel sad, because they felt sad if you were sad and they didn't like it. Well, it meant that something's wrong. And so we're, we've been very conditioned to make sadness uh, a negative emotion. It's no such thing. Sadness is not a negative emotion. There are no positive and negative emotions. Good and bad. Sadness is bad. Do all you can not to feel sad. How hard do most human beings you know, how much effort do they put into not feeling sad? And actually, 
repress actually feeling sad, not showing the sadness, even trying to hide it from themselves. What happens in this seeming falling away, dissolution, annihilation, <laughs> can be that there is no defense, there is no barrier to sadness. And so all the, those, all that repressed sadness is freely expressed. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were tears and tears. Because how many times did you try not to cry? But sadness is beautiful. This is beautifully sad. Uh, there is a sweet sadness though, you know. If it's not avoided, if sadness is, it's not allowed, but it just is not, re you, you don't have to allow it, you just have to not, <laughs> if, there's a, if there's not the one who is avoiding, repressing, pushing away, turning away, if it's just, if it just is, it's beautiful. And it's most obviously love. It's more obviously love than what we normally call love. Maybe the fullness, the reason I don't speak about it is, fullness sounds like there's, there's everything, everything appearing all at once. And that's not how it is. So, for example, it, when there's sadness, there's only sadness. You know, if, if sadness isn't pushed away or, or boxed or tried to be managed, if, it isn't, if the manager isn't present and there's just sadness, then everything is sadness. The wall's sad. The tree is sad. The tree is crying. It's not me crying. There's only sadness. And then... When there's joy, everything is joyous. You know, the tree's laughing, the pavement's laughing. Because <laughs> that's really how emotion is. When, when, when there is powerful emotion, it's, it is all consuming. It is everything. I mean, we all know that, but because we have this sense of it's, oh, it's just me and it's mine, there's this dreadful sense of isolation that I have to keep it. And it's my responsibility then to do something about it and all of that. Whereas it's just freely appearing. It's not, it's really not a problem. I make emotions a problem. Self makes emotions a problem because they threaten me, you know, to overwhelm me. I'm not in control of them. So emotions are the enemy, really, to self. Whereas they're nothing to fear. It's the most beautiful part of being human. Is feeling. And but self is afraid of feelings. Really, that a lot of the fear is because I I if I started crying, self says I would never stop. If I allowed the sadness. If the sadness came, it would consume me. I've heard lots of people say that. That's the fear. And the wonder is there's no one, there was no one ever to be consumed. And there's no danger in emotion at all. It's not dangerous. Me says otherwise. I think that's why I could. I, it feels now that life has very little fear to it. There's not much natural fear of what what's happening could create natural fear, just as it would for any other animal. But that's what not what most human beings call fear. Is is fear for me, for my sense of who I am, is in danger. Well, that there's none of that. Funny though, you won't, there won't be a noticing of the absence of that. It's only in thinking, yeah, that just doesn't happen.
without self-consciousness, there isn't, um, there are, there's no one to defend. But the body looks after itself naturally, like you said, so naturally fear. If the body is in danger, then the body reacts to it. If a snarling dog snarled next to you, the body would just jump out of the way. It wouldn't be you jumping out of the way. And the self knows this as well. You know that you jumped out of the way before you thought about jumping out of the way. The thought comes after. You know the sense of when there's, um, uh, there are quite a few clues for self in um, traumatic events, like accidents. You hear heroes saying, Oh no, I didn't do it. I didn't do any of it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not a hero. I didn't do it. It just happened. That's, that's how life is. <laughs> but it takes that physical danger for the body to act before self can actually feel that it's doing it. Could you talk a bit about um, the fact that nothing is happening? What's that about? What is that about? Yeah. <laughs> What's all that about? That's not easy to talk about. I guess if I say that, if there's, there's only what's happening, and what's happening is nothing happening, there's no knowing that nothing's happening. The only knowing is what's happening. <laughs> but the what's happening is just an idea or thoughts or words about what's happening. So nothing, <laughs> nothing happening is just a way of saying you don't know what's happening. There is only what's happening. So the what's happening is what you know about what's happening, or what could be known, which is just ideas, story. So the story is happening, but you don't know what that is. It's just a story. So the nothing is the not knowing. But this is undeniably happening. It can sound like nothing happening is a denial of what's happening. And yet, it's not at all. It's just simply that what's happening can't be known. And that's all there is. So words like nothing, emptiness, not knowing, silence, stillness, are just pointing to the obviousness that <laughs> it can't be known. And of course nothing can't be known, there's nothing to know. It's wrong in a way to say it, because it sounds like there needs to be a knowing that there's nothing happening. Is that kind of where your question's coming from? Yeah. yeah. There's no knowing of nothing's happening. How would that be known? The happening is what's known. This is completely known. So the knownness without knowing what, <clears throat> the isness, the being, words are completely inadequate. Just whatever there is, is always completely known, and yet you don't know what or why or how. That's illusory, all of that. So in that sense, nothing's happening. Because the what's happening sounds, if you say you know what's happening, it pins it, it's, it's what knowledge, the illusion of knowledge is that it, it makes it into an event. So I know what's happening because it's happening now. 
and this is an event in time that's happening. That's not actually how it is. That's always, that's a story. This doesn't have a beginning or end. And in order to know, it has to be a separate event. It, all that knowing does is separate in order to know. Because if it's not an isolated object or event, then it can't be known. So when I, I don't know if that's necessarily what, <laughs> what others mean by nothing's happening. That's probably my best effort at trying to say what that means. It doesn't actually mean, it really, for me it only means that I don't know. There can be knowing, but the knowing is empty. Emptiness is nothing happening. So this is both completely known and completely unknown. Completely knowable, absolutely unknowable. The knowable is always relative. It has to be a subjectifying what's happening into separate events and separate objects in relation to each other. That's what we mean by knowing. You could say there is a... <laughs> There is a knowing that knowing is not the right word for. The isness, the being. They're the only words we've got, really. But you don't know, there is no need. What self says, I need to know what's happening. And so I separate it and it becomes more and more and more complex with all separate objects and separate events and how they relate to each other, relative thinking. That still happens, but it seems to be empty. And in that sense, nothing's happening. But it is all that there is. And everything happening and nothing happening sounds like I've made sense of it. That's not it. It's really that it's the energy, the effort, the trying to make sense of what's happening. It doesn't seem to happen. And then there's just what's happening. And you can't find a beginning or an ending, so in that sense nothing's happening. Because for something to happen it has to have a beginning and an end, it has to be discrete. And there's no, there's no edges or boundaries to find, both in time and space. That, that can still be done in exactly the same way as it would have been, but it's, it's kind of like it's not believed anymore. So the edges are seen, so I can see the edge of that window, and so the window starts there, and it goes across there, and it ends there, which is what we call knowledge, really. Because I can then, <laughs> I can then discriminate the window from everything else. The window is a separate thing from everything else that's appearing. But really, the appearance is whole. I like the word whole, I like language, I always have done. And of course the word in English, whole, means both complete and empty. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. So whole with a W is completion. And whole without a W is an empty abyss. Nice. <laughs> it means nothing, but I do like it. And of course, then there is the word holy as well. And there's three English words that are pronounced holy. Holy, complete. <laughs> holy. <laughs> Got holes all in it. <laughs> it's all space. And uh, sacred. Nice. Bullshit, but nice. <laughs> I don't know, you know. 
don't read any significance into that, but isn't that nice? So I, I noticed that one day and thought, oh, that's lovely. Wrote some shit poem about it. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Look how clever I am. <laughs> but it is nice, though. I like the, I like whole and whole. Because the completeness is, is the not knowing, is the emptiness. Is the whole. And self is always afraid of falling. I don't know about you, but one of the things of my experience of depression was being in a big black hole from which there was no escape. And self is absolutely terrified of nothing. But nothing is nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear about emptiness. But self is terrified of it. Emptiness is it's neither benign nor frightening. It's not good or bad. Emptiness is complete neutrality. But this is utterly neutral in an absolute way. God is not good. The devil is not bad. There is no God or devil. There is no good or bad. Until you make it so. That's it. I create, I create the demons and I create the angels. If you get a glimpse of this, if self gets a glimpse of this, then it can feel terrifying because it can feel really groundless because there really is no ground. The illusion of self is that I stand on the ground that I stand on. I stand on my own, my ground. I mean, it's a big thing in therapy, isn't it? To feel grounded, so you feel, oh, you're losing your shit. It's all falling apart. You go to the therapist and you do some grounding therapy. So that I feel solid again. Because this sense of not feeling solid is what we're talking about. That is what we're talking about. We're talking about what is most feared by self. That I could fall apart. All the cliches of mental illness. Falling apart, breaking down. Feeling groundless. Disintegrating. And it's the most wonderful news that there is no one, no one to fall apart, no one to feel grounded or not grounded. This can't fall apart. There is only this, what's happening. What's happening is all there is. There are no parts to this to fall apart. The reason you fear so much is because you are the illusion of being real, solid, human being. Not a solid human being. Me. And it's like self can get a glimpse of its own illusory nature. You know, the fact that <laughs> there is no ground. You don't stand on the ground. You're not solid. You're not real. And that's terrifying. But there's nothing to fear. But in the seeming falling apart, it's likely that there's terror. And yet it is what's longed for, to be free of that fear. To be free of the effort of holding it all together. Such hard work, such a job, constant, with moments of absence that you then say, I want some more of that. And those moments of absence are 
what most people call, you know, their most beautiful experiences, but they weren't your experiences, they were simply the absence, they were the, the absence of experience. That's how it feels here with my awakening experiences now. If I try and recall them, it's like, oh yeah, of course, it was just, I wasn't there and there was an okayness and a peace that did pass, didn't make any sense at all. I couldn't make sense of it. And of course I couldn't make sense of it. I wasn't there making, trying to make sense of it. That's what it was. And then I tried to make sense of it in order to get back to it and have more of it. It didn't work. You may have found that out already. That doesn't work. It can't work. Because me cannot work towards the absence of the one who's working towards the absence of itself. That's not going to work. So in the story, it could seem like you need to try everything. You know, you need to exhaust all the options. That's most people's story. Most seeker stories are, <sighs> I've come to a point where I, I'm done. I, I think I've tried everything. I think, I don't know. But even if I see something new, the motivation to follow it, that's fucking gone as well. Now I know I haven't tried everything, but even the, there's no attraction in a new path. Ah, oh, just another path. It can simply be obvious that the, there is no path away from here. You know, there's no path to here. There's no path away. You didn't come on a journey to get here. There is nowhere. There's, this isn't leading anywhere. And I can see why it, it can be this, when it's heard by self, this can sound nihilistic. And it, you know, I get that leveled at me quite a bit. And I know other speakers do as well. You know, this is a nihilistic message of hopelessness. But I can't emphasize enough that it's not hopeless at all. It's not hopeless at all. There would need to be hope for it to be hopeless. There is no hope. There cannot be hopelessness if there's no hope. And there's only hope because of you. Because of I. I lives in hope. So the absence of that hope is not hopeless. That's me speaking. The future is hopeful or hopeless. There is no future. Emptiness is not hopeless. It's empty of hope and hopelessness. There is neither. It's not positive or negative. But of course, what most, nearly every, uh, every popular message, every popular teaching is offering hope. Because self, really, really hates feeling hopeless. It's terrible for me to feel hopeless. It's an awful feeling, and I'll do anything. Just give me a shred of hope. You know, it's that desperate, the desperation of me. So this isn't an, off this isn't an offering. This is not offering anything, because everything is... You, it already is. And it sounds like it's suggesting something needs to be lost, but it's not that either. There is nothing to lose. And if you have nothing to lose, then there's very little to fear. But to have nothing to lose, it seems that self has to lose everything.
which is painful to me because I'm, I'm the holding on. The whole sense that I, I have things. So it's not that you could lose everything, it's that there's no you already to have anything. You already have nothing, including yourself. <laughs> it sounds terrible, doesn't it? It's not though. So I use the word this all the time. There isn't this. There isn't a this. I haven't found this. I don't know this. I haven't got this. I don't understand this. There's nothing to be understood. The joke isn't lost that tradi traditional speakers in a Vita always called this that. I think that's funny, don't you? Do you think that's funny? Oh, well, that makes me laugh. So I say this and they said that. <laughs> Turns out this and that are not two. That's funny. I mean, there you are, that's non-duality in a nutshell. This and that are not two. That's it. <laughs> Can't get much more simple than that. Because for most, for self, you know, I'm this and you're that. That's really it. That's all we're speaking about. I'm not speaking about anything else, really, other than the sense of I'm this and you're that. Not appearing. And then you don't know this from that. And yet, <laughs> the knowing of, the speaking about this from that, just the same. The perception of this and that, just the same. Kind of like you just, there's no believing it. I mean, it's such a, um, the conviction, all conviction is gone, that this is different from that. So the difference is still obvious, but the sameness is obvious too, that there isn't. It's the same difference. So you're a different human being from this human being, but there is a sameness that you can't speak about. That all the speaking about, everyone who's ever tried to speak about this is trying to speak about a difference, uh, a sameness, a wholeness, a completeness that can't be spoken about. Because the difference remains. In fact, the difference is even more obvious. You know, the difference between human beings is really the uniqueness of each human being. Individuality, you might call it, is more obvious, not less. I mean, that's paradoxical. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, does it? If it's all whole and there's no difference. <laughs> the difference would be so now I see each of you as a different human being, or they're seeing of different human beings, absolutely unique, beautifully unique. No. But I'm not comparing them with me, which is what I always did. It would always be what's similar about you to me, what's different about you to me, and in that there's a categorizing and judgment of the differences in relation to me and my beliefs and my values and my history, my experience. And so the, the difference is really obvious, the uniqueness, the individuality, you could say. Because <laughs> it is quite funny that it can sound so uh, the sameness makes everyone just an amorphous mass of humanity. It's, it's actually less of that. The, the individuality of each human being is more pronounced, 
more, more obvious. But I see the human beings as I would see a tree, you know, an oak tree and a beech tree together. Yeah, they're trees. But look how beautifully different they are. You know, it's that kind of difference that you wouldn't, because you wouldn't be comparing the tree to yourself. But with human beings, your oh, self always does that. I'm comparing myself and I'm inferring yourself and comparing yourself with mine. And that's hugely divisive. Immediately, there's this, this massive barrier gulf between human beings. Energetically. <laughs> Sorry. But if human beings are only like trees, and you can see the beautiful difference in trees, or dogs, or birds, but then it's obvious in human beings. And so human beings are more beautiful, no doubt about that, in a very really simple, obvious, direct way. That they couldn't be other than they are. Because the problem that self has with other human beings is, of course, I could be other than I am. That's why I'm fucking working on myself, to make myself better than I am. Well, if I can be different, that's the whole sense of being me, then of course you can. And what does that do? That makes me hugely critical of how you are. Can't not. I'm hugely critical of myself. I can't help but be critical of you. I'm working on myself. Why the fuck are you not doing your work? You need to see a therapist. <laughs> I could recommend some really bad ones. <laughs> you know what I mean, though. It's well, there's no, um, there's no peace in that, and really, there's, and it's funny that we call that love as well. Again, there's no love in that, really. It's what we call love, but it's utterly conditional. That, yeah, there's some really things I really like about you, but there's so much that you need to improve. You know, it's horrible, isn't it? It's hideous, actually. <laughs> it's what we call normal re relationships. It's like saying to the tree, I look at the beech tree and I go, mm, you see those lovely curly leaves, the oak tree? You need to be more like that. You know, it's as stupid as that. So it can sound like forgiveness, and it can sound like acceptance, and it can sound like um, surrender, and a lot of spiritual ideas, but it's not, it just, just doesn't occur without this sense of, I could do better, you could do better. I did quite a lot of work, therapeutic work, on self-criticism and self-loathing, self-hatred, self-sabotage, all those words with self in the front. <laughs> Have you noticed if you go to a therapist, that's all you're doing? Every, every action has a word beginning with self. <laughs> And of course, for self, it, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of that, but for self, it can be therapeutic, because it's much better for self to be self-affirming than self-critical. So you start to do some affirm affirmations every morning and stick your stickers around your mirror. <laughs> I did that, and I, I felt much better for a while. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, I'm not saying, I would never say to anyone, don't do that. The other day I googled how many words there are beginning, um, hyphenated words with beginning with self. There were too many. I think it was over 800, I think. It was amazing. Mm. It says a lot, though. 
And self wouldn't even notice that, of course. No. Just because we take self as a, as a given. Self takes, it's, um, it's, it's quite obvious that for most people, there's something much more sacred and sacrosanct than God. And it's self. Is actually self who is God. And self made God in his own image. Just a fucking great big self. Omnipotent self. Looking after everything. Got to have someone to blame. <laughs> self has to have someone to blame. Otherwise this is chaos. This is absolutely wild and unknown and unknowable. There's got to be a reason. And if there's got to be a reason, there's got to be a cause. And if there's got to be a cause, there's got to be someone to blame. Some fucker's fault. This shit show is like it is. So really, this is a, just a suggestion of what if there is no, there is no one to blame, simply because there is no one. That's really, that's what's on offer. What then? There's no one responsible. Simply because there is no one. There's no one irresponsible either. There's no one. No individual ones and no almighty one. No ones or one. Thinking does actually happen. Think, thinking happening. Yeah. Yeah, thinking happening, the same as everything else happening. <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't categorize thinking as different from anything else that appears. It, it can just be, mo it can be more obvious with thinking that you don't know where they appear, what they are, the form of you know, that can be obvious, whereas a chair appearing <laughs> seems more obvious that a chair is more convincing, convincingly real than a thought. Like the location of the chair? Yeah, because you could, yeah, because you can, you can say what it is, or think you can say what it is. But actually, chair is a thought, anyway. <laughs> actually. Until there's the thought, chair, the label, the naming. The naming is the only reality yeah, as a separate object, it. isn't it? I mean, that's all a bit intellectual, but... So the chair, chair is an appearance, but it's not a separate appearance. So what language does, or what thought does, by naming the chair as chair, it says, I know the chair as something separate from everything else. Whereas the appearance doesn't actually have any separation in it until thought yeah. appears. Until you say, chair, there isn't chair separate from everything else. In that sense, you can say that everything's empty. And the naming seems to make it full of stuff, of things. The thingness of life is... See, there's no, see, there's no seeing of the empty. You, there is only the stuff. So this isn't <laughs> the emptiness and the naming of things, the, the thingness is not. And I know that experience for me is not really blind, but it's like I wish I could just get myself together to blindfold myself for a whole day so I don't have to create this world around me. And sometimes as I've been Strive, it's many years ago, but I was like sitting in my bed, you know, 
trying it out again and wait for half an hour. And then mm-hmm. like, oh, fuck, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is, uh, yeah, everyone knows the relief of closing their eyes. Yeah. You know, there's relief in that, isn't it? Hence, it's so popular. God, it's a very popular spiritual practice. Sitting still, closing your eyes. Big deal. But, you know, but then self makes that a big deal. It's not, but there is some respite from the, the seeming everything, visually. So, ear plugs in, close your eyes, get in a, what's it, a sensory deprivation tank. Has anyone? I know you've probably heard it many times before, but this is not talking about anything experiential. And that would just be another experience. And I do, I, it does kind of appeal. I like the be interesting. But really that has nothing to do with, you know, blind or deaf or the, lo- the loss of any sensory perception. It's not, it's not what we're speaking about. This is... <laughs> it would just be more of nothing and less of everything. But less of everything is still everything. And nothing. There wouldn't be less of nothing. There can't be less of nothing. But self does like experiences or can find some peace and rest and um, respite in less of everything. Hence, mindfulness, meditation are hugely popular. Because they give you a little bit of less of everything. Seemingly. But if everything is already nothing, then that makes no difference. It's really not less. <laughs> really. If everything is already nothing. There's not less of this if you close your eyes. Yes, sir. No. The problem for me with closing my eyes was always there'd be more thoughts filling the space. Because I was afraid of the emptiness. So whenever I tried to meditate, (laughs) it was quite dreadful. Because I filled the space with, because the emptiness is a threat, so I filled it with thinking. I think that's quite common. Maybe with practice you get better at it. I never stuck it long enough to get anywhere with that. I know people who have got, a, you know, you may have done as well, who've got a lot of peace from that, at least some. Well, there's no sense, there's, own, there's no sense that I know what you think you're talking about. Well, that's the illusion. The illusion isn't that I can think I know what you're talking about. That is what we say, I know what you're talking about, which is never true. I never know what you think you're talking about. There can only be the interpretation of the words, which will be completely unique to the human. Each human being who's hearing the words will interpret the words in an absolutely unique way. That's why the word you can always say, I'm always very happy to say that the words are completely irrelevant. It's nothing to do with the words at all. Because each of you hear the words that come out of this mouth, you will have your own meaning, interpretation, understanding, knowing of them. And there, however many hear the words, there will be that many interpretations of what they mean. But that's very obvious. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now that isn't always obvious, it's rarely obvious to self, because self, what self does is, I have my understanding of the words that uh, I'm saying, self says I understand what I'm saying, and there is an expectation that your self could have the same understanding. No wonder there's so much misunderstanding. <laughs> I mean, that's an argument right there. That's all arguments just about. I say something to you. You don't hear what I'm saying. And by what I'm saying, I don't mean the words. What I mean by the words. <laughs> you can't hear that. It's impossible. <laughs> you hear the words. You make sense of the words from your understanding of each of the words and how they, what they mean together. And then you go, that's bullshit. But the, what you've called the bullshit has nothing to do with what I meant by the words. It could be exactly the same. But if that is clear, there is great, there is great freedom to speak, though. Because you don't give a shit. You know it can't land how it's... It just can't. No, it's bullshit. It's beautiful. Beautiful bullshit. All the words. You know, UG or it's a, you know, just a dog barking. What are you fucking... <laughs> I used to love it when you get angry and say, why are you hanging on my words? They mean nothing. <laughs> oh, the, and really, they don't. They're, they're empty. And if all the words are empty, there's freedom to speak or not. It makes no difference. Silence or barking, singing, Stillness, meditating, or dancing. Lovely. It doesn't. One's not better or worse than the other. If you prefer <laughs> sitting still, sit still. If you like dancing, dance. If you like speaking, speak until the others tell you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> So if there's freedom, then, then freedom doesn't make sense? What? Well, no, because there, there is no free... No, there isn't a thing called freedom, no. No, this is free. Yeah. It's free in both senses of the word free as I understand them, here is my interpretation of free. Free in the sense of completely open, which means not known. All knowing confines and limits. Knowing is all, knowledge is all limitation, boxing. And this is boundless, that's a Tony word, and he'd, and he'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, in that sense of free, no boundaries. And the boundaries are knowledge and knowing. So the boundary of the chair is the limit of the chair. Well, there is no, there is no chair. There is, this, there is not a boundary between the chair and everything else. This is whole. Perceptually. And then not knowing segments it, breaks it up, compartmentalizes it. And then from the, from the objectification of each part, then builds a complex relationship between the parts. I know the relationships between the parts. If you've been with small children, you know this is what small children are doing. They're learning to do that. So they learn objective words, you know, and the parents get absolutely thrilled with each new piece of knowledge, which is a word. Absolutely, like ecstatic. <laughs> that they're becoming a self with knowledge. So, and language and self is really clear if you've been around children of, you know, between one and two, when self appears somewhere in there, that it appears with language.
Both. It appears with me calling myself me, or as Harry called himself, my little boy, he called himself my, <laughs> which was lovely. So it was a combination of me and I, and he put them together and made my, and he my do that. My want that. My like that. My no like cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just telling a story about you know with small children it can be clear that language and uh, the sense of identification as the word my and me and I and often children will just young children will use their name as themselves that's very common that so the the parents again parents get so excited when kids know their name <laughs> Parents get really excited with when the child becomes identified because then they're becoming a, always like a little person. <laughs> yeah, fucking in prison for the rest of it. Or you bastards jumping for joy at his imprisonment as a tiny little self. And there's great joy in it because, you know, that's success. How would you be successful as a human being? without that sense of self. That's what self says, you know, it's, it's the only way. And up until that point, when that child becomes a self, they're really nobody. Somebody asked me, did you try to, um, you know, stop the self appearing in your children? <laughs> like, no. No, I think, you know, I am incredible, but that's beyond my powers. <laughs> Yeah, I do have delusions of grandeur, but I thought, no, it's probably beyond me. So I didn't try and do that. So there's no work to be done. Hurrah! <laughs> really? Really? I'm not saying accept your conditioning. There's fucking no acceptance required. Conditioning is as it is already. You don't have to accept it or not. It makes no difference. But if you resist it, if you challenge it, if you challenge how you react to things because you don't like it and you want to be better, don't you? You want to be less reactive. I don't like, I don't want those thoughts. They're conditioned thoughts. It's just endless work. And it is never ending. That's why self likes it. Because if it was ending, you'd be fucked. As soon as it came to an end, that would be the end of you. Because you are the, what you've called yourself is the whole energy of becoming. <laughs> and you've missed your opportunity to ask that vital question <laughs> that would have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for being here, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, and as I said in the break, I've really enjoyed it, so I couldn't give a shit whether you have or not. <laughs> Thanks.